Hi and welcome to our part 3 of Excel Like a Pro. This is the advanced course. These are pre-recorded webinars that I have from one of my suppliers and in this video we're going to cover topics naming cells and cell ranges, statistical functions, text functions, left, mid and right functions, documenting and auditing, protection, using templates and creating and managing templates. I hope you like this video and down below I'll leave links to the first two courses as well so you can go back and catch up if you missed anything. Hello, I'm Rob. Thank you for joining today's webinar. It's part three of our Excel Like a Pro training series. This is the advanced session. Across the past two months, we've covered the basic and intermediate topics in Excel. In this, our final session on Excel, we'll cover some of the advanced topics. A friendly reminder to make sure you've watched parts one and two of our Excel Like a Pro series, because naturally, today's session builds upon them. And you can look for those earlier sessions on YouTube, and we'll post there, this one there as well. Okay. Let's get started. Here's our roadmap for today. We'll start out with more on functions and formulas, including naming cells and cell ranges, statistical functions, lookup and reference functions, and text functions. And then it's on to documenting and auditing, and we'll finish up with using templates, how to build them, and how to create and manage them. But first, let's start with where we left off in our intermediate session with more on functions and formulas. And first up is naming cells and cell ranges. So what does it mean to name a cell and why would we do it? Well, typically when we talk about or reference a particular cell, we do so by its coordinates, A21, G12, R3, etc. This is the language of Excel. And when we write formulas using cell coordinates and ranges, we are speaking Excel's language. And as we all know, that can be cumbersome because cell G12 has a greater meaning to you and me than the worksheet coordinate G12. To us, it means team sales, right? But when we're creating formulas in this worksheet or in other worksheets or workbooks, it's simply an insignificant and fairly arbitrary G12 that we would write in those formulas. And it's also probably a temporary G12 because G12 could easily become G13 or G14 or G83 if and when we add new cells. So instead, let's make Excel learn our language, right? Let's give this, the cell G12 a name, like team sales and make it easier on ourselves and anyone else with whom we may share the spreadsheet. Uh, obviously naming cells and cell ranges is another Excel organizational best practice. Um, so before I show you how to name them, let's talk about that real quick. The benefits of naming cells and ranges are that they are easier to remember and that reduces the likelihood of errors and they use absolute references by default. So now let's look at how we do it. We're going to call this cell uh, very simply Team Sales. So we could right click on it, click Define Name, write in Team Sales, add a comment or two if we wanted to, and then click OK. Now, you'll notice something up here in the left near the formula bar, there's Team Sales. We could have named it here as well. Initially, that would have said G12. I could have double clicked on it and changed it to Team Sales. So there's two really easy ways to uh, define names. There's a third up here. I'm not gonna show you that now because you've basically seen it. So you'll notice there's an underscore there are some rules around naming cells. Let's quickly go through them. 
You're capped at 255 characters, no more than that. The names need to start with a letter, an underscore, or a backslash character. You can only use letters, numbers, underscores, or periods. No other characters are allowed. And then this one's a little bit of the tricky one that can get you into trouble if you don't know about it. Strings that are the same as a cell reference, for example, B1, or has any of the following single letters, capital C, lowercase c, capital R, lowercase r, those cannot be used as names. So, let me show you now how to name a range, because this is pretty cool. We're going to call this, this is all of our uh, individual sales reps totals for the week. So we're going to highlight this entire range, and we'll name it up here. We'll just double click G2, and we'll call this rep sales. Okay, very easy. And here's where the power of naming is demonstrated. If we did a formula equal sum, whoops, sorry, sum, and then start typing in the name and look, here it is, rep sales. It's added it to Excel's database. Click that, hit enter, you get the same total. You didn't have to do anything fancy. If you were going to gather a bunch of different weeks together, it'd be really, really easy. You wouldn't have to go back and forth from spreadsheet to spreadsheet, clicking on specific cells, or worse, trying to remember them as you built your spreadsheet over time. One last thing on naming cells, if you make a mistake, or you wanna change things, or uh, you change the way you talk about things in your company, you can go to Name Manager, and there they are. You can edit them, and you can add to them, or delete them. And one last thing before we move on, I mentioned uh, one of the benefits you can see here, it's got the dollar signs, the ranges that you name are by default named as absolute references, which means if you move the cells, the name goes with it. Okay, let's move on to our next topic. Now let's look at some function categories. As you've already seen, Excel is rich with functions. Last time we looked at several logical functions and some date and time functions. And today we're going to look at three additional categories. The first up is the statistical functions, and there are three that I want to walk you through, average if, count if, and sum if. The average if function can be used to figure out the average of a range based on certain criteria. For example, remember the list of National League Cy Young Award winners from our last webinar? Let's use the average if function to determine what the average ERA was for those pitchers who won more than 20 games in a particular season. Here's how we write the formula. Let's scroll down to the bottom and we'll put it in right here. Equal average if left parentheses and I've already named my cell ranges so we're going to put in wins, and you can see it highlights over here to the left. And then we're going to say uh, wins that are greater than 20, or actually greater than 19, greater than 19 equal comma, and then the second range I named was ERA. Hit enter, and there you have the average. Those pitchers who won 20 or more games had an average an ERA of 2.44. So I bet you can imagine how this function could come in handy for finding averages across a wide variety of scenarios. Some examples would be the average sales of orders above a certain quantity, average units sold by a particular region, or the average profit by a distinct quarter. Some food for thought on average if. Now let's move on to a uh, sibling of average if, and that is called count if. The count if function is great for finding answers such as how many orders did client X place, or how many sales reps had sales of $1,000 or more this week, 
Or how many times has a pitcher from the Philadelphia Phillies won the Cy Young Award? Let's use that last question to demonstrate the power of the count if function. We've got a little placeholder down here for our formula. And we're going to enter in equal count if. And then once again, I've got a range named, and that range is team. Hit our comma. And then we type in Philadelphia. As you can imagine, it's absolutely essential to type in the text exactly correctly. And then we just hit enter, and there's our answer. And if we took a glance, this is a fairly small table, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven fillies. So um, there's a myriad ways that you can use the count if function. Obviously, the bigger the table, the more power the count if function will provide you. It's a great way to get basic information about whatever you like that involves counting uh, number of occurrences. So let's move on to the third statistical function. This is the uh, last in this group, and it's called sum if. Let's return to our Cy Young Award winners list and use the sum if function to show us the total number of strikeouts by the pitchers on this list who are in the Baseball Hall of Fame. We have our placeholder down at the bottom here. As always, we start with our equal sign and we do sum if, if, and we've got a named range for Hall of Fame, comma, and we have the letter Y for anyone who has been inducted. And we want to see the number of strikeouts. And that range is called strikeouts. Double click. There's our answer. So sum if is a great way to do a number of real world uh, statistical analysis on the fly. For example, total commissions on sales above a certain price, or total bonuses due to reps who met a target goal, or total earnings in a particular quarter year over year. So that wraps up our, look, our quick look at statistical functions. Now we're going to move on to a really cool set of functions called lookup and reference fun functions. So the lookup and reference functions are designed to ease the finding and referencing of data, especially in large tables. We're going to start at the specific function called lookup. And to give you an overview of how it works, we're going to use this uh, small spreadsheet. So to get your bearings, cells A1 and E3 relate to a variable interest rate that is paid on a bank account. For balances under 1,000, the interest rate is 3%. For balances between 1,000 and 10,000, the interest rate is 4%, etc., etc. et cetera, okay? Now, cell A6 shows the balance of a specific account. And then the lookup function is used here in B6. And what it does is look up the interest rate and applies it to the $45,000 balance. So note that the exact value, 45,000, isn't found in what is called the lookup vector, or B1 through E1, right? 45,000 isn't in here. And so the function matches the closest value below 45,000, and that's 10,000, and it returns the corresponding value from the result vector. And that's these here. This is the result vector, B3 through E3. And here's our result. So the formula looks like this. You can see the reference A6. You can see the lookup vector of B1 through E3. And then you can see the results vector 
of B3 through E3. So that's the basic way uh, the lookup function works. And I'm going to tell you something that's a little bit complicated, but try to stay with me. So you want to note that the vector form of the Excel lookup function can be used with any two arrays of data that have one-to-one -one matching values. For example, two columns of data, two rows of data, or even a column in a row would work as long as the lookup vector is ordered alphabetically or numerically and the two data sets are the same length. So pay attention to these areas here. They work together and they are not, um, they correspond uh, in length. So now let's move on to two more uh, lookup and reference functions, VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. So when we're talking about these uh, reference functions, VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP, often they're used to pull information into reports. So I'm going to use a report setup to demonstrate how to use these functions. So here we have a worksheet showing sales reps, their sales, some data about pricing and revenue, and the clients that they sold to. Here on the right, I've started setting up a report. Next to the sales rep, I've already done a data validation using a list as the criteria. I covered this in a previous session. And all the reps are available from this drop-down menu. Okay, so let's just pick a rep and we're going to use the VLOOKUP function to find the price. So we start in the standard way, equal VLOOKUP. And now we're going to use our lookup value, which is actually whatever is in cell H2, comma. And now our table array, that's the entire table, not including the header row at the top. Okay. And let's go back up, comma. Our column index number, that is actually interesting. It's the number of columns to the right of our lookup value column, which is column A. So we want to get the price, so we're going to count from left to right, one, two, three, four. It's the fourth column, so we enter four, comma. And for the range lookup, for our purposes here, we're going to write false. True and false are the choices. We're going to write false and hit enter. All right, so you can see here rep 16, the price is 83. If we look right here, you can see there's the 83. Now let's do a similar VLOOKUP for client. All you need to do is we will just copy and paste, and we're gonna make some changes here because we need to continue to look at H2 and client is the fifth column. So we change that to five, and client 16 is, goes with rep 16. So that's pretty simple. If we change the sales rep, everything else changes to match. Pretty cool, right? So, this is just a small table in a simple table with a very simple report. Imagine a huge table where answers are rows and rows apart and would take quite some time to hunt down. With VLOOKUP, however, that data becomes instantly accessible. One last thing, what exactly does the V stand for? Have you guessed it? It's vertical. In other words, it means by column because columns are vertical. So at the outset, I mentioned that VLOOKUP had a twin function, HLOOKUP. Have you guessed what the H is for? Yes, horizontal. HLOOKUP is for tables where instead of column headers, there are row labels. 
But because this is so rare and because the syntax is exactly the same, I'm not going to demo that for you. Instead, let's move on to our next uh, category of functions, and that is text functions. Text functions contain some very powerful tools to adjust and rearrange and even combine cell data. Most often, these functions are used with worksheets that contain information and function as a database. I'm talking about collections such as mailing lists, product catalogs, or even Cy Young award winners. Let's revisit our list of great pictures for this next demo. So the first text function I'd like to show you is concatenate concatenate. It means to link things together in a chain or series and it's almost as cool to say as it is to do. So again here is our Cy Young list and let's say for our purposes we didn't need to see the wins and losses in separate columns. All right? We just want to see it in the common way like 22 and 10, specifically 22 hyphen 10. And we could do this by going into each cell in the win column, double clicking, adding a hyphen, typing 10, and going down the whole list and then deleting the losses column, right? In fact, if I had a list of only 10 of them, I'd probably do it that way. But when you have dozens or hundreds or thousands of rows, Combining column data by hand is completely inefficient. Uh, it, it's especially inefficient when you know how to use the concatenate feature, which you're going to learn about right now. So here's how. First, we're going to create a new column where our function will reside. Let's get rid of what we typed here. New column. And we'll call this when hyphen L and let's go with our formula equal concatenate we won't even type the whole word and we're going to do D2 comma and let's just type E2 since our formula is overlapping and enter okay we're getting there we've got a 2210 doesn't really make sense without the hyphen though so Let's pop back into this formula, put our cursor right after the comma, D2, e, uh, quote sign, hyphen, quote sign, comma, and magic. And then obviously you could just copy and paste these down and you can see them all fill in. So we did two columns, but you can do more. You can combine three, four, as many as you need using the concatenate function. It's really great if you want to combine data such as first name, middle initial, and last name. Maybe you're making a mailing list. You don't want separate fields. Um, or maybe city, state, and zip. You want to combine those. It all depends on really how you want to have the data appear. Okay, but what about this redundant information? You have a few choices. First, you could just hide the wins and losses columns, right? Remember that from our first right click and hide them. Or, um, well, you could hide them and so they're not visible and you may also be tempted to delete them. Um, but beware, if you do, your new column with the concatenate function in it is gonna have a reference error. But if you're certain you want the wins and losses to appear in this new format, there's a step you have to take before you delete anything. First, you make a new column. And what we're going to do is copy this. And then we're going to do a paste value. Oop, that's, here's our new location. Paste value. So what we've done is we've moved from a formula to the actual information. So again, be very careful if you delete 
your source information without doing this step, you're going to be left with nothing. And we'll need to go back to an earlier version, redo the concatenate formula, and go through this process again. So heads up. So um, one of the things here uh, that I also want to point out if you delete it or you want to do the actually um, forget about going back to a previous version of the spreadsheet here's another reason why you want to be extra careful before you want to delete you can't use some other function to put it back the way it was in this case because our data is inconsistent if we look at our wins column Sometimes wins are single digit, sometimes they're double digits. Same with the losses, singles and doubles. In other words, the position of the hyphen is not consistent. We see it sometimes as the second character and sometimes as the third character. So I'm telling you this right now because it leads into our next topic, our next set of text functions. And let's uh, take a look at those now. Now we're going to talk about the left, mid, and right functions. These are used to tell Excel that you only want part of a text string in a particular cell. So here we have a sample product list. On the left we have the product ID, uh, and it seems to be a random set of numbers and letters. Um, but really it's a code that gives us not only the product number, but also the factory where it was manufactured and the date of manufacturing. So let's say we want uh, data in this product ID pulled apart so we can work with it in different ways. So first let's pull out the date and here's how you do it. You do equal write and then the source cell which is A2 where our product ID is and then we're, we're counting back uh, from the far right toward the left and uh, a date occupies six characters and enter and so we have the date here now it's not going to be in date format but we can see that this is January 4th 2018 if you're using the US style of dates okay let's do the left and pull out the item number very similar equal left still a2 and we have a five digit product number, so we type in five counting from left to right. All right, so 10323, you can see it matches up just fine. So last is the mid function. It's similar, but it has an extra requirement. Equal mid a2, comma, and uh, we're going to count from the left and we're going to start with the sixth character and we want it to then start counting at six and count a total of three which is the factory code and enter and if we were to copy this down there you go it works a lot like concatenate but with uh, a kind of a different use utility right so it's pretty simple and just like we saw before uh, with the concatenated wins and losses you can copy and paste value into another column or row and then you can sort it and format it you don't want to work with the left mid or right function cells you can't even reformat them. So just remember, this is a tool to get you to another place. And all of this works because remember, uh, you have to have consistency of the source data. So it all works because every one of these product IDs are the same length. If they were different lengths, you'd have to do something more artful. And we're not gonna cover that in this particular uh, session. All right. So uh, that's it for text functions, and let's move on. We've talked all along during this series about organizational best practices, 
from setting up orderly worksheets for consolidation to naming cells and cell ranges to now documenting and auditing. The concept we've been promoting boils down to one idea. Make your Excel files easy to understand for both yourself and anyone else who may use it. And that includes auditors. A clean, organized worksheet, more often than not, results in clear, error-free data, formulas, and functions. Our first topic in this section is commenting. The purpose of commenting is to add notes to yourself or especially for others. And they can include reminders, things that you still need to do, or uh, formulas you need to adjust. They can include explanations of how a particular formula works or why uh, a particular column is set up the way it is. And it can inclu include, of course, suggestions, notes to other people for changes you'd like to see made. So let's add a comment. You'll find the new comment button under the review menu up at the top. Here's new comment. First, click the cell you want to use for your comment. Click new comment. And let's say, remember to double check rates above. Okay? So when you're done, you just click outside the area and the comment disappears. But it's here where the red flag means. So anywhere you see a red flag, you have a comment. Okay? So what if in this case your name doesn't appear in the comment? Here's how you change it. Go to File, Options, General, and then down here, and then just change the username to the name that you'd like to show up in the comments. Now don't worry if you've already done a bunch of comments, it will make the adjustment for you. No need to go back and change each one of them individually. Okay? So if you'd like to format the comment, you just click inside anywhere and you can format the text right here format comment and you hear you have the different text controls like you've seen other places in Excel if you want to change the color of the box the background color here which is yellow see how this cursor changes to the four triangle the four arrows right click here again choose format comment and now you have a whole range of other choices and you can change the background color under colors and lines, something like that. Hit OK, and now you have a blue. I know uh, a lot of managers who use different colors for different members of their team. So there's certainly options. Um, it's difficult to change the default color of comments. It's actually something outside the scope of our conversation today, but you can Google that and it'll tell you how to go into your Windows properties and make that change. And it is a universal change, so if you put comments in Word or PowerPoint, it'll change the background colors of those as well. So next, you don't have to roll over each one of these comments to see them all. You can just put your mouse over it to see them or you can click on it to see them. You just go up here to show all comments, and there are all the comments that are visible on this particular screen. Last, to delete a comment, click on the cell that hosts it, and then go up here and hit delete. Or you can do the four arrow again, click on it, and then press delete on your keyboard. One last thing, you saw maybe the handles. So if you've got a lot of comments or you want to minimize the space they occupy, you can do that and just drag, or you can obviously make it big and bulky if that's what you would like. So that's the basics of adding, formatting, and showing comments. Use them as you see fit. Next, let's talk about auditing. And what we really mean is formula auditing. This is, this is an advanced way to check your work. We're all familiar with the yellow diamond symbol we get when a formula has an error. That's the live, in the moment way 
to make sure all is well with the formula. The other way is to click on the formulas menu and look at the section called formula auditing right up here. Here we have a number of helpful tools. The first is trace precedence. This will show where the formula looks for information. Make sure first that you have the formula selected. Let's choose this one and then click trace precedence. And so we'll move our screen over here to the left and you can see that it's pulling information from D2 and E2 and bringing it in to F2. Let me show you uh, another spreadsheet that is even more dramatic in how uh, it shows the, the trace auditing. Let's turn it on on this spreadsheet. Check this out. Pretty cool. It's pulling from up here, down, and from here in. That's a really slick way to trace how a formula is working. Very cool. Now to hide the arrows, you just hit remove errors. I'm sorry, arrows. Let's go back to our other spreadsheet. Next, we have show formulas. Let's get rid of these arrows. Show formulas. So what that does is it expands all of your columns and it shows in a much easier way, in a, in a much bigger way, all of your formulas. And what's really nice about this is you can pop in, you can check your formulas on the fly very easily. And then if you click show formulas again, it brings your column widths back to the way they were. So it's not something that you suddenly have to go back and by hand shrink down those column widths again. So next we have error checking and this is the manual way of uh, the same feature that we saw earlier that pops up automatically. This feature lets you check all of the formulas at once. So we click it, it checks through it, uh, I have an error in here because I set one up so you can see it visually and we could go in and correct this uh, issue uh, and make it right. So last, let's get rid of this, we have evaluate formula and this tool is, allows you to check through a formula step by step and it shows the results of each individual part. It's another great way to debug a formula that isn't quite up to par. Let's see it in action. So here we have the formula that we want to evaluate. We click the evaluate formula button and we get this dialog box. And you can see it's starting with D2. It's got an underline there. So we click evaluate and look, it's changed it to the actual value of D, uh, uh, D2, which is 22. We evaluate again and now it's shown us that E2 pulls in this one more time and now we see the result of the formula. So you can trace your way through this uh, step by step and figure out the issues that you may be having in a formula. So that's a look at the set of formula auditing tools in Excel. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is protection. With protection, you're able to lock and prevent changes ranging from individual cells to groups of cells to worksheets to entire workbooks. You can also protect comments from being moved or the text edited. Let's start with the most common protection, the entire workbook. Obviously, this is used when a workbook contains confidential or sensitive information. For example, pre-release quarterly results, employee salary tables, staff member evaluations, to name a few. So here's how you password protect a workbook. This is the highest level of protection. It prevents the opening of an entire workbook. Click File, and then Info, and Protect Workbook. And then encrypt with a password. Enter in a password, and note the caution. You don't want to lose or forget the 
password, it can't be recovered. You probably want to use password management software to keep track of all your passwords because you don't want to use the same password multiple times. We all know that. And remember that passwords are case sensitive. Click OK, type it again. I'm only using four characters. Obviously, you'll probably want to do something more secure than that. So once you click OK the second time, you'll see a very handy visual. It turns yellow. That means we're protected. To take the protection off, retrace your steps. Just double click on the password one time, click OK, and now the yellow is gone and the workbook is unprotected. While we're here on the info page, let's look at some other levels of protection. The first is Protect Sheet. This allows for the workbook to be opened, but individual worksheets to be protected as you see fit. So it's right here, Protect Current Sheet. Let's see the options. Now we're taken back to the worksheet and we see a variety of options for what is allowed. In other words, by default, if you protect a worksheet, very little can be edited without the password. Anything you check here is what is allowed. And this dialog box is also where you would activate any cells that you have locked. So you can see here, protect worksheet and contents of locked cells. So here's how you lock a cell. So let's choose this one. And all you need to do is right click, choose format cell. And here on the right is protection. And you can choose locked. And you can hide the formulas by choosing hidden. So let's see what that looks like. Click hidden, click OK. We got to do one step here, which is we have to protect the sheet. Now watch what happens up here where you can see this formula. So let's do a quick password here. Say OK, password again, it's gone. So unlock cell, you can see the formula. Lock cell, you cannot see the formula. You can also lock comments in the same way as we just locked a cell. So here's a comment. We, let's make sure we hide the, uh, show these. And we've got the, sorry, we need to unlock our worksheet first. All right, now you can see we can edit this. Format comment, and here's protection. You can lock it, and you can lock the text. And again, you have to then go and protect the sheet to uh, institute that feature. So last, in the same way that you can protect the sheet from here on the review tab, you can protect the workbook. This is just a quicker alternative to linking, uh, to clicking file and info. So that's an overview of the protection and security features in Excel. Let's move on to our final topic. So as we look back on our journey through Excel to this point, our focus has been on creating worksheets and workbooks from scratch. As we finish up, let's look at some of the templates provided by Excel and then walk through how to create your own. So during your course of working with Excel, you've probably, like I have, passed right by the collection of templates on your way to creating new workbooks. In fact, if you're a dedicated keyboard shortcut user and use Control N to start new workbooks, you never even get to see the display of templates. Here's how to see them. Click File and New and Look at this collection. There are 25 built-in templates. Who knew? There are business-oriented templates such as Gantt project planners, process maps, a sales invoice template, just a wide variety. There's even personal things such as calendars, to-do lists, and more. So let's pop open one of these, let's see, let's try the loan amortization schedule. If you're thinking about buying a house or you already have a mortgage, this is a great tool. And maybe you would look on the internet to find something to do this, or maybe you would try to create something on your own. But look, there's already something in Excel. It has comments that explain how to use it. It's got the formulas built in 
So you just need to change one thing and you have a brand new uh, worksheet tool. And you can edit it and save it back as a template if you like. So let's go back in to the templates. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Up here at the top, it says search for online templates. Let's try lists. Don't even leave Excel. It just brings up a whole new category of all kinds of different lists. Such a rich collection without leaving Excel and risking the wild west of the internet. You don't want to download random Excel files that you find on the internet. They could have macros that can do damage to your computer. So trust me, stay with an Excel. So even more important is over here to the right, we have a huge category of all kinds of different templates. So this can be a really good time-saving source and a source of inspiration, saving you time, minutes, hours. So that kind of reminds me of a hidden benefit of templates. They can help you work through formula design. Take for example, let's go back home here and let's use this employee timesheet. So over here you have some formulas and it figures out regular time, it figures out overtime. So by using some of the tools that you've already learned about, we can see how this sheet is designed. What a great way to visually figure out formulas without Googling, without trying to figure out the specific syntax way of asking a question in Excel. So that's built-in templates. Now let's look at how you can turn your own well-designed worksheets into templates. So not only can you find and explore myriad templates, but you can also create your own in just a few clicks. All you need to do is once again file, do a save as, you want to work your way to your location and then save as type and then choose Excel template. So really easy. But before you do one of these on one of your worksheets, some tips. Let's click out of this. You want to remember to finalize the look and feel of your template. Choose your colors, choose your fonts, make it look really nice. You want to use the review and auditing tools to make sure there aren't any errors. You want to remove any unnecessary data. Let's say you're going to send this loan worksheet on to a friend. Well, you don't want your financial information in there, so take it out. And you want to unprotect cells or protect them as appropriate. And last, you want to create comments as they did here to give others guidance. So there you have templates. How to find and explore Excel's collection of available pre-built templates and how to turn your hard-earned workbooks into templates for reuse and sharing. I hope you liked this video. If so, please hit the subscribe button and a thumbs up. If you want to be notified of any videos as we release them, please hit the bell icon below. Thank you. Bye.